Hello everyone, my name is Jeffrey Walker. You're watching Blurring the Lines presented by Australians in Film and my special guest this week is my dear friend Guy Pierce. Guy, welcome. Thank you very much. Well, I'm so excited by the fact that you're directing a feature for the first time, given that you because have you such think a... I might cast you in it. Is that is that that why? It's... Well, the reason I know a little about the film is because my son auditioned for it unsuccessfully. The interesting thing about this role that we are casting about this young boy is that he is actually inhabited by the spirit of an older man. So we need a boy who is very, can, can be very calm and very still and sort of in, in, in a mature sense. And your lovely, sweet boy, as lovely and sweet as he is. It's never sat still. I don't think he's ever sat still in his life, has he? he could, I couldn't even frame up the camera without having a pan <laughs> and following him around. And he did have one note for you as well. He thought it needed an octopus. He did that. He just thought that, you know, a great story needs an octopus. Anyway, I'll leave that How did I overlook that? That's, How that's... did I overlook that? Well, what I was going to ask you is that I'm going to run a few directors by you that you've worked with. And what I'm going to ask is, and you can do a, a brief answer, a long answer. It's up to you. Were they as good as you? Is Were they as know? good as me? It's always going to come back. You know where it's going to end up. Yeah. Okay. Chris um, if, you could, if you could steal and take a little something that you've learned from the director that I'm going to mention. Maybe you could share with us uh, what the, you know, the great perk of that collaboration and also maybe uh, something that was unique to that director that would be fun to put in the arsenal of the Guy Pearce directorship that's about to begin. Are you Ooh, ready? Okay. It's like a game show. Okay. Here it is. So the first one I'm gonna start with is a director I know you love very, very dearly, Curtis Hansen from LA Confidential. Um, patience, a wonderful, a wonderful eye and, um, a, a, a really wonderful ability to know how, and, and look, I'll probably say this about all of our directors to some degree, because I think communication is the key. It is for me as an actor, as far as what we do. So communication really is, is the key. Um, but Curtis's ability was really the first time that I'd recognised that a director has to talk to this actor in one way, has to talk to this actor in another way, and has to talk to this actor in another way. And Curtis was just fantastic at that and genuine. You know, it wasn't like he was sort of putting on a, some sort of front in order to deal with so-and-so. Um, but he just... And I think this is one of the things also that, as an actor, you're always looking for, is that sense of trust yeah. that you feel that you trust your director, but that you feel that they trust you as well and that they know what you're capable of and that they trust you to do it. And Curtis is very good, was very good at allowing you to feel that and showing that um, and just giving you the slightest little something to steer you in a particular direction. Some directors can just go on and on and explain things way too much and it becomes head noise and you go, ah, you know, like you, for example, it's awful working with you. No, yep. Like, mm -hmm. like, Shut up, Jeffrey. Mm. Um, but Curtis, I mean, he was delightful. And he really was, for me, I suppose, it, it, it was my first American film. Right. It was also like being at film school, I suppose. You know, a great sort of um, cinephile. And just I just learned so much about film acting from him, about being still, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, he really was just incredible. Well, obviously, if you want to impart the stillness that you learnt... Cast, not casting my son was a very wise move. I wonder how Curtis would have gone with that. Oh. Well, <laughs> we should have bought him. Um, I'm going to go to Todd Haynes, Mildred Pierce. You won an Emmy for it and you were fabulous. What was uh, Todd's, Thank you very much. What was Todd's, uh, what's his trick? What's he got up his well, sleeve? Todd, um, that you can steal. Well, Todd had a wonderful, I mean, the thing that I really recognised about Todd, as well as great communication and, and a really great understanding of the material and also a great sense of respect for what we were doing, he had a wonderful enthusiasm. He really, you could really feel that he just loved every kind of word that was on this page and every moment. And even if something wasn't working, he loved the idea of trying to work it out. So there was something really energised about working with him and not in that kind of, you know, sort of um, gym instructor, come on, you got to do it, kind of, not in that kind of way. He just genuinely had a really wonderful um, internal engine 
that was infectious and sort of intoxicating and, and wonderful to be around. And, you know, wonderfully sensitive and funny as well. Really funny, funny guy. So, yeah, I just, oh, it was adorable. And it was great watching him and Kate work together because Kate also has a wonderful energy about her and is a fantastic communicator. And it's just really, just really honest. I think, I think it's about honesty as well. I love it when a director can whinge about something, can com complain about something and can really kind of be honest about what's happening in front of them. But then equally... Um, and genuinely, with the same sort of energy, look to solve the problem, you know? So it's yeah. a great, it's just a fantastic kind of outlook. I think being included in the solving of the problem makes you earn that solution a great deal as well as an actor well, instead of just being Absolutely, and that comes back to the trust again too. You know, I've been on jobs before where there's some issue going on behind the scenes and you, and you say, oh, what is it? And like, nothing, nothing, nothing at all, nothing. Get back in your trailer, go away, go away. <laughs> You'll freak out, we'll lose you, go away. <laughs> You're like, come on, I'm 52 years old. <laughs> you know. um, I'm going to go to a big gun in Chris Nolan from Memento. What could you, what could you take from... <laughs> what could you take from Mr Nolan? Uh, you couldn't take anything from him. Certainly not his suit jacket. I think what did you, can I ask, character. what did you know of Christopher Nolan when you started that film? Like, he, how established was he as a filmmaker at that time? Well, he had made Following. He had made a film called Following, which he, he, which he shot himself. Yeah. Uh, he wrote it and he shot it himself. And it's a black and white film that, that really just explores this idea of a character who, who, who sort of says, what if I just sort of chose anybody out of the crowd and decided to sort of follow them? What, what what would this bring to my life? What, you know, and of course it leads to, to, to sort of all sorts of, um, you know, uh, difficult situations, shall we say. But there's a wonderful tone and quality to that film. So Chris had done that and he'd written this script and I don't know what else he'd done. I don't know that he'd done a whole lot else at that point, but I read that script, Memento, and I watched Following and I just went, oh my God, I have to do this movie. This is just, I completely get it. This is so exciting to me and really just, it felt like it tapped into all of my own internal workings, which, you know, for any of us, we can become a little fixated on and obsessed over. But all that stuff, all that, sm that the minutia of our, of our psychology, to me is what's interesting about getting across on film. It isn't about the big stuff, the explosions and the kind of making things bigger and bigger. It's about getting into the tiny details of one's behaviour, one's psychology, you know, the, the dynamic between people, et cetera. That's what I find fascinating. And that's what's great about film as opposed to on stage because the camera can come right in and really just focus on something and the way you edit it and the way you linger on something can just have such incredible effect. And Chris in the way he wrote that script. And I've never done a film where the finished film is as much like the script mm. as Memento. So that script and that film are exactly the same. Wow. He edited that, he edited that before he made it and there it is, <laughs> you know. So he's incredibly meticulous. But the thing about Chris, and he's sort of a bit like talking to a sort of not a mad scientist, but he's got a sort of rather professorial quality about him. He's all super intelligent and, you know, really quite sort of, um, yeah, highly intelligent guy. Mm. But he's equally as able to talk about the emotional state of somebody and, and what a movement or something a character might do will uh, impart as far as what an audience will feel that that character is experiencing. So... And I say that, I suppose, because Chris, as we all know now, is incredibly technically proficient. He knows his lenses, he knows camera moves, he just can tell you pretty much about any film that exists, what they were using at what point, in what time. And that scene, they shift, they changed from that film stock to that because they were using such and such lens then because in 1965, that lens had changed, they da 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 So Chris knows all that stuff like the biggest nerd of all time. <laughs> But as I say, he's also all over the emotional stuff. So he, he really was so inspiring. And I think there is something to be said about his approach to the big blockbuster that ultimately the problem that all the characters are trying to solve is so personal and intimate. You know, that's what, when I'm watching his films, I think probably leaps out, that he can create yes. a ginormous science fiction conceit, but 
it can be derailed or it can be, you know, the characters can be united, but it's all going to come down to something very, very small and personal and intimate. And I think that's, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And I, I just think he's, yeah, he's got such an eye for that. He's really, he's really, really clever. Um, can I ask you, uh, what could you flog from uh, Catherine Bigelow as the Hurt Locker? <clears throat> well, that's a tricky one because I really only worked with her for three days. Well, she did a bit of convincing to get you to come there. I wonder if that's, well, that's something right. that if you, yeah, if you, need, if you need an actor to come and uh, join that's showing some resistance. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's what it is. Well, I'm not as sexy as her, so she, she's <laughs> quite, you know, she's quite, it's hard to say no to Catherine Bigelow. Um, <laughs> Yeah, look, it was a long process. And, and of course, uh, you know, the, the role, I, I said, well, it's just a really great film. It's fantastic. But, you know, I'm, I'm dead by page three. So I don't know if this is what I want to do. And at that point, this is sort of 2007 on 2006 leading into it, um, you know, I really wasn't looking for kind of cameos per se. Um, so, <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, I really was resistant to it. And, and she said, look, it's just really important that we believe. I mean, she was very flattering. She said, it's just really important that we believe you are going to be the lead of our movie mm. so that when that rug is pulled out from under the audience, they go, oh, you know. So I went, oh, all right then, Catherine. All right then. But, but as I said, it was a tricky one because it really was only a couple of days. So I don't have a, a huge memory other than the fact that I was in a really hot bomb suit and I could barely hear anybody for most of the time. And then I sprained my ankle at the very end. And you also had so the unfortunate thing that the blood spurter went off right in your face before it all right, happened. I yeah, when they they set a they set a a, a coil and and a, and a and a a squib, you know, at the I think at the at the top of the helmet inside the glass, you know, so that when the explosion goes off, it was meant to go on the screen, and of course, it, you know what it's like. It takes a while to sort of run the wire up through your suit and trying to plug that in, and it, you're sort of standing there. It was a million degrees, and I'm in this bomb suit. And sort of get that in place and I got the helmet on and just sort of fiddling, fiddling, fiddling and sort of taking forever and there's makeup girls and everyone's sort of standing around and just all of a sudden it went off. Okay, reset, take the helmet off, reset, hang on. So there's another sort of hour of <laughs> resetting all that. So of course once it's gone off the first time, then the, the second time you're going, is this it was how do we is this gonna work? <laughs> you know. A little gun shy so from there, that time on, yeah. Yeah, a little bit little bit but of course I was playing a you know highly trained bomb expert so I couldn't show that I was gun shy. The last director I'm going to ask you to steal from is Ridley Scott in Prometheus Experience. Um, lay it on me. <clears throat> well what a legend uh, mm. uh, really. Um, it's, it's hard not to go into uh, working with somebody like that without sort of projecting onto them <laughs> or bringing in your own kind of uh, sort of historical sort of viewpoint, you know, you and particularly with something like Prometheus, because there was this history of the Alien films, um, particularly Alien, the first one that I'd watched, I think, you know, in 1980 or whenever it came out, it was when I was about 12. Mm. So it's it's like meeting a really famous person and sort of figuring out how to kind of be around them and deal with them and try to be as normal as you can. But Ridley's very down to earth, you know, he's a really down to earth guy. So you kind of forget that stuff quite quickly. Um, I mean, I just, you know, he, he, he yeah, I mean, he, he's incredibly communicative. He has a lot to say about a lot of things. Following him sometimes is tricky because he's got a, also got a really strong accent. Funnily enough, he's from the part of the world where my mother is from. So at least I, I sort of had that up my sleeve a little bit um, in the northeast of England. Uh, so I could understand um, most of what he said, but he really goes from talking about historical events to talking about what you're doing technically on set. Um, but again, like all of these sort of great directors, he's he's very in tune with what you're doing and what he wants from you as well. You did tell me that that one great thing is sometimes I imagine a big film like that, and I know that you've been part of some films where it's very storyboarded or it's previews and, and that's the way it goes. Whereas I know that you were saying of Ridley that he still cleared the set and it was a cast rehearsal to get everything going. And, and that, that does create a, you know, a feel that it's not this big behemoth of a monster picture. It is something that we're still going to create together. No, and, and, and he's got a very warm, I mean, you hear these stories that it can be a real grouch with people, et cetera, et cetera. But I think all the best people can be. I think if all the, if, if, if people are, 
if people don't do their job properly or if people mess up or if people, you know, et cetera, et cetera, or if people kind of lie or, you know, all that stuff, you've got every right to be grouchy with people, you know, particularly in sort of, you know, in, in this business when time is money, you're, the, the sun is going, you know, things have to be sharp. Hmm. And so I've seen Ridley snap at people, but not like any more than anybody else by any means and not unjustifiably, to be honest. Um, and, but it has a, he has a really warm sort of humorous quality about him. And for somebody with such history and, and carrying such big behemoth type films, he really does make the experience very, very human. Um, I think he, he wants that more and more himself. It, it says a lot about a director, how, how they direct about what they want as a human being, what they want back from you. And I think that's one of the things that I as a director or I as an actor who's going to direct something, People keep saying to me, oh, my God, you've never done it before. How, 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 do, you, how do you know? Are you going to be able to do it? How do you know if you're going to be able to do it or not? And people keep sort of lumbering this anxiety onto you about, about whether you can do it or not. And I just think about all those wonderful directors that I've worked with. And I think about people. And I think about the fact that I've been on. I mean, I've made 60 films now, including television sort of shows as well, you know, like, like miniseries or whatever. And I think all of those people who are calm, who are warm, who are great communicators, who, who always remind themselves of what, the, they, what they want in a scene, what's important in a scene, and actually stay calm through the process. I say that now, I'm sure at some point when a producer is saying, the sun's going down and we're running out of money, I'll, I might be a little more, um, you know, my anxiety may be a little more provoked. But I do think that kind of you know, level-headedness is, it's certainly what I want, and it certainly, I think, gets the best out of people. I've seen... I've seen people on set be fairly hot-headed and it, and it often doesn't end well. <laughs> so, no. so, and I think, you know, we've got a seven-year-old boy on, on the set. We've got a 15-year-old girl. So, you know, we've got, and I really, it's a really delicate film. It's yeah. a really delicate film as far as the dynamic between characters and slowly lies are coming out amongst these characters, etc. So it's, it's not about the big stuff at all. It really is about the intimacy of, of, one's psychology etc so i think you know adhering to that having a gentle and communicative um approach on set which i've seen in the past is is uh, will be vital yeah mm, that's beautiful now i wanted to ask you now uh part just listing off you know those films part of uh your appeal as a, as a fan and someone who follows your work is your choice in projects. I think that you're, you're quite a trusted brand that if whatever project you find yourself in, it'll be interesting. It'll have challenging ideas. Often it's a, it's quite different than what we saw you in last. What is your process of, of choosing, of choosing those projects to build that, that library? Well, thank you. Firstly, uh, the funny thing is I, I don't know what it is other than just following my own instincts. You know, I read something and go, oh, wow, I've never seen this before. This is fascinating. Oh, what a, what a fascinating character. Oh, I think I can do something with that. So mm. I just respond in a way that is organic and truthful, I suppose. I never understand it when you see an actor sort of play the same role all the time. I just don't get It's fine. Like, they do, might do a really good job of it, but I just don't understand it. I grew up doing a lot of theatre you know, in, in Geelong. I grew up in Geelong and I did lots of theatre and we would do musicals and plays and, do, you know, one minute you're sort of doing, you know, some straight play and the next minute you're, you're playing the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz. And so I suppose I was brought up uh, with a lot of versatility. Now, there are probably other people in that theatre company too who may not be as versatile as me. I don't know. So it may not just be that. I mean, my mum was quite, you know, quite a funny lady, she is <laughs> quite a funny lady. And, um, and so, you know, and, I, and the other part that I often keep wondering about is I have a sister with an intellectual disability and I was brought up with her, her, just her and I, and watching her try and fit into this world and watching how other people respond to her. And I feel like my experience with her and the fact that she's so different and she carries insecurities that are sort of different to the rest of us. I, I, I can't help but feel that, that she, Tracy, my sister, that that experience plays some part in my view of the world and my kind of um, 
journey as far as expressing myself in kind of unusual ways, perhaps, if they are unusual, you know. So I don't know, but, but it wouldn't surprise me if, if, if having Tracy in my life was perhaps part of it, you know, part of why I choose and why I want to explore and why I want to delve as deeply into the characters that I do, you know. Since I last saw you in the flesh, you've become a father. And I wondered, how has fatherhood changed your life and how has it changed your, if it has at all, your career? Well, it's changed my life enormously, as I guess all parents would would uh, attest to. Um, my, I, I notice I'm much more patient than I used to be. I, I, you have to become patient, clearly. And, and I'm far more emotional than I was in that there was actually, funnily enough, for years in my working life, if I had to cry in a scene, I'd bring it on, I could just do it like that. And then there came a period where I where I became a much sort of happier and more grounded and sort of together human being where the tears just dried up and people would want me to cry in scenes. And I'm like, no, I can't do it anymore. I'm so sorry. It's gone. It, they all dried up. Now, no problem. now I can cry at the drop of a hat. Mm -hmm. And somebody said just before Monty was born, they said, well, you know, when you have a child, it's like living with your heart on the outside. Ah. And it's so true. It's so true. I'm just so completely vulnerable now. And, and, and it's, it's sort of through him, I, I guess. I mean, he just melts my heart every day, you know, a hundred times a day. So, so yeah, I'm much, much more of a softie again, which is good. Um, and how has it changed my career? Well, the little bastard stopped me from being able to work. <laughs> I mean, I'm stuck here being a dad. So, so cop that. Great parenthood, fantastic. Mm. My last question is about your other passion that is uh, over either of your shoulders, I think, and probably in every other part of the room and your studio back in Melbourne, is mm -hmm. music for you may rival or even supersede your love of the film business and performance uh, you know, in front of the camera. What is it about music that just does so much for you? Where does it, how, why does it feed your soul so much, particularly the creation of music, the writing of music and the recording of it? Well, uh, well spotted. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's completely personal and, I, and it's all about what I invent myself. It's just all about me being free to sort of create. And obviously, you know, when one gets a script and you see a character and you feel that character and you sort of jump in there, on some level you're creating something. But at the same time, I'm, I'm answering to something. I'm, I'm getting on board a train that's already moving and I'm, and I'm trying to honour it as best I can. And that's really exciting for me. On, on that level, you know, I, I don't feel like I'm a highly original person. I don't, know, I don't know that I have stories coming out of me ad infinitum like other people do and I can write scripts and just come up with stories. That's sort of not really who I am. But jumping on board as an actor is fantastic because I can really see the world and go, yeah, and if I fit in here, then that's hopefully really going to work. Um, music, on the other hand, is just completely inventive. I just, and, and the great thing is I just sort of do it on my own most of the time. So I don't have anyone saying, no, 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 we want less of this and more of that. I can just do what I want. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, you know, I'm lucky that my acting life has afforded, uh, you know, the ability to, to be able to just sort of make music. I mean, I, as we know, I, 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 I kept it all to myself for many, many, many years. So I have a rather conflicted relationship with music and the releasing of music. Um, uh, but, you know, it's, 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 it's vital to me. And really what I've realised, it's not about performing it for other people. I mean, it can be, but it's not really about that. It's just for me about making it and, and putting together parts and actually, you know, and hearing it myself and going, wow, how beautiful does that sound with that? And, and just enjoying that. I suppose it's a bit like a gardener who loves planting a seed and then just enjoying the flower that comes out. They don't have to show the garden to everyone else, but they get to enjoy it themselves. Uh, probably a bit like Sam Neill with his wonderful farm and his vineyard in New Zealand. I think it's a great outlet that's very separate to everything else. Um, I'm so grateful to you for chatting to us today. And I know that the people who have watched and gone this far, I don't know why they've watched for this long, but they have. And I'm very grateful to you for tuning in and watching. And um, you know, working with you, Guy, changed the course of my life. It's been, you know, it's been really, really special. My mere association to you has made people think I'm better than I am. So thank you very much.
Well, thank you, Jeffrey. And as you know, Jeffrey and I have actually been friends for a very, very long time. I knew Jeffrey when he was a young, a young lad. Mm. So it goes further back than Jack Irish. So yes. thanks, Jeff. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you so much for chatting.